Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Bach, Director of UCAN's Endurance Business. First of all, thank you to Felt for co uh, partnering with us to put this event together. And with me today is the legendary Hunter Allen. Welcome, Hunter. Hey, Matt. Glad to be here, man. Thanks for having me on the show. Always love working with you, and I love talking power meters, and that's your thing. That's your bag. So <laughs> this is gonna, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, I'm, I was lucky enough to meet you early last year in Boston at a big endurance expo uh, and was extra excited because I learned that he's been using UCAN for many years. Uh, we'll touch on that in a little bit later on. But uh, for now, I want to say a whole bunch of amazing things about you, which is easy to do. So Hunter Allen is the godfather of power meter training and racing, having literally written the book on it. He's viewed as the premier expert on power meters, having done presentations and consultations for athletes and coaches all around the world, including for Olympic teams, Olympic athletes, pro cyclists, and also a bunch of mere mortals. <laughs> uh, Hunter is a former pro cyclist who raced for the team uh, for Team Navigators, raced mountain, BMX, and road bikes for 17 years. Hunter co-founded Training Peaks WKO and is the founder of Peaks Coaching Group, a network of amazing coaches that caters to cyclists and triathletes around the world. Anything I missed there, Hunter? <laughs> That, uh, that's pretty good, Matt. There you go. You got it down. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you've accomplished some pretty amazing things. And uh, we're going to be talking about power meter training and racing today, like all about what it is and why you would want to use a power meter and how to use them and how to implement them into your training and your racing uh, to get the most out of yourself, to really be like a tool to enhance and make your, your training more effective. Uh, so this is absolutely right up your wheelhouse and really excited to have you on today. Oh, thanks, man. Um... Excited to always talk about cycling, always talk about power training, you know, I mean, uh, and, and, and nutrition too. So all these things are my passion. So it's great. No problem. Excellent. So you can and felt bicycles. We're excited to bring you the guru himself, Hunter Allen, to talk to you today about power meter training and racing. Let's dive right in. First of all, Hunter, what is a power meter? Ah, it's a great question. So a power meter measures the amount of power in wattage, so in watts, just like the wattage in your light bulb, right? But we actually are measuring wattage as a measurement of work uh, in the way that we think about it from that perspective. So it measures two different things. So wattage is created by the torsion or torque on a part. So there is torsion, twisting on a part in all kinds of places in a bicycle, on the crank arm itself, in the bottom bracket axle, in the spider, in the hub, lots of different, in the pedal axles, lots of different places. And so how much that twist or how much force you, 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 it takes for it to twist, we can measure. And then we multiply that by your RPMs, your cadence. And so what that occurs is torque times cadence then becomes wattage, how many watts you produce. So all these power meters measure that number and that measure that torsion, that torque or twisting, and then the cadence. It's a really interesting way of talking about it, actually. I hadn't really heard that kind of explanation of it before, but you're right. There's so many different places on the bike that receive that, that transfer that power. So the power comes from the rider, goes into the bike. There's a whole basically transfer system of power so that it turns the wheels and makes you go faster. And so Absolutely. that's why there's so many power meters that, that measure power from different places on the bike, which we'll get into in a little bit yeah. later on. Um, so when did you first, I mean, you've been working with power meters since the very, very beginning of power meters, basically, like you were the pioneer uh, of, of power meter training and racing. And so when is it that you first heard about power meters and started using one yourself? No, oh, you know, I had a client come to me in 1997 and say, hey, you know, uh, I bought one of these newfangled power meters uh, and would you coach me with it? And I was like, uh, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> um, because I didn't, when I was a pro, I didn't have a power meter, uh, and they weren't even around then. Uh, this was 1997, end of 97, he bought a power tap hub, which was called Tune. The company was called Tune at the time, big monster honking hub thing, weighed like two pounds, uh, on your rear wheel. Um, and, and, he, he started sending me spreadsheets and numbers and 500 watts, 1,000 watts, 200 watts. I was like, I have no idea. What, what does this mean? Is this good? Is this bad? I don't know how to interpret this information. So I bought a power tap as myself at the time. Again, it was this big gray honking tune hub and, um, and started training again. And, you know, because one of the most important things that you can do as a coach, if you're coaching somebody with a power meter, you have to have a relationship with that data. 
I have to know what does it mean to go do hill repeats? What does it mean? How many watts do I produce when I do a sprint? How many, what does it take to um, climb up a mountain and how many watts can I average climbing up a mountain? So that was like, once I started getting that again, and I started training again and, and actually, well, gosh, you know, I hadn't, I retired from pro racing for a while. I hadn't trained for a bit. And I started training again, even did some races because I wanted to see for me, what did it mean to actually win a race with this data? Um, and so then that was when we started to really understand it at a deeper level. Uh, it was 99, um, 2000 was really when we started to think, okay, this is revolutionary. Mm. So you started dabbling with it, started experimenting it on your, uh, with yourself, looking at all the data, trying to really digest what it all meant. And then how did you go from that, which is really the very beginning is the advent of power meters. And how did you go from that to becoming the world's expert on power meters? <laughs> Well, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fun story and a great journey. Um, and in 2000, there was the first ever power meter s seminar that was taught by, it was done by USA Cycling, uh, started it and was in Philadelphia. Dr. Andy Coggin, the co-author of our book was one of the presenters. Uh, Dr. Alan Lim was one of the presenters and Dean Golich was one of the presenters. And, you know, we were all packed in a little hotel room uh, and, and they presented all day long. And kind of the theme of it was that this is an amazing tool, but we don't have the software to actually analyze this information. We can't, we can see what a single day looks like and that's interesting, but we don't have a way to aggregate this data and look at it over time. Because the software at that point was very, very rudimentary. I mean, it was, it was literally, here's a graph of your data and that was all it was pretty much. So. Um, my, uh, my client at the time, Kevin Williams, he and I went to this, the seminar together and, you know, basically over lunch, he was like, man, you know, I'm a computer programmer. I can build the software. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, I, this is what I do. I can build software. I'm like, okay, well, let's build it. You know? So we set out to go and build uh, a piece of software, which we originally called cycling peaks software. And um, then we launched that, that software in 2003. Uh, in the meantime, you know, we, we were talking with Andy Cog and a whole bunch because, you know, we were seeing trends. We were seeing things that nobody else was seeing in 2001, 2002, um, because we created this piece of software that he and I were only using and nobody else in the world really had an understanding of what was going on. And so, and I would go to Andy and I was like, Andy, you know, I think this is a, you know, this is happening, right? You know, I'm, I'm not a physiologist, not an exercise physiologist. So I, I can see trends. I can figure out how I want to see the data. I'm really good with that piece of it. But I had to go back to him to validate and say, is this a real thing? Is there some background in physiology? And so he was, yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So we came up with a lot of things as part of that. One was called training stress score. Uh, because I said, oh man, we need a score. How do we score all these workouts? So we came up with that and a bunch of other tools. And we launched that on the world in 2003. And, uh, and then around, oh, I think 2005 or so, um, we, uh, we merged that company, Cycling Peaks, with a company that Joe Friel and his son, Dirk Friel, and another guy, Gear, uh, had started called Training Bible after Joe's book, The, the Cyclist Training Bible, The Triathletes Training Bible. Uh, and so Training Bible and Cycling Peaks became Training Peaks. Uh, and that's how the Training Peaks company was born at that time. And then Andy and I just got tired of answering the same email over and over. And so we're like, we got to write a book. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I went to Velo Press and, you know, lobbied them for like two years. You know, I was like, oh, man, I was like, you got to print this book. You got to print this book. It's going to be huge. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. Finally, I just like flew out to Colorado and did a presentation with their, their editorial team and their, and their publisher and everybody. And, and they're like, okay, sounds kind of cool. Okay, we'll do it. But, <laughs> they're you know, twisting their arm to do it. But now how, and now how many languages and how many copies sold? I mean, it's, it's all over, right? Yeah, eight languages, nearly 200,000 copies sold. I think it's probably the second, or no, it's I think it's the third book that they've most sold of all the books that they've sold uh, behind Joe's two triathlon bi uh, uh, Bible books or bi triathlon and cyclist training Bible books. But um, 
yeah so i mean who knew right mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. we did <laughs> you keep pressing that's right right you gotta keep trying you gotta keep put, keep the pressure on and so then you know and then, then it continued to evolve and uh continued to to move forward we we created some new other new tools uh and uh on how to plan a periodization cycle so that you peak at the right time and we came out with second edition and then uh just recently in 2019 we came out with the third edition of training racing with the power meter uh so you know and in the meantime i kind of went on tour around the world spreading the spreading the knowledge to coaches and athletes and and uh and just really trying to talk and spread this knowledge like that's been the goal all along is how do i make more people faster achieve their goals better quicker and shortcut this you know trial and error kind of process of training hmm. yeah let's get into a little bit of the why around power meters you're kind of alluding to some of the reasons why you might want to use a power meter but what is it that before power meters we didn't have and what were sort of the shortcomings of the, the tools that people were using to train themselves that power meters helped to solve? Right. So a couple of things that that um, made a really big difference, and that was um, the fact that um, we have heart rate, which is a uh, is really just a um, a response. It's not really um, a way. It's not it doesn't tell us how much work we're doing necessarily, um, and it just tells us how fast our heart's pumping, right? I mean, it's just, it is just that, it's just a response. So that, 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 that works fine, but it's impacted by a lot of different things. And so it's, it's just kind of like, well, it, you know, it's not that easy to possibly train by all the time. And so when we have a power meter, then all of a sudden now we've got a real reason that we can do something with that. Uh, and, and figure that out and, and use that work. So let me show, uh, let's see if it'll work here, Matt. I've got a, um, a couple of slides here that, that might work for us. So uh, let me see if I can get this going. So let's think about from a dose response perspective um, and you know, power is the training dose. And when we think about this on the, the X axis here, here is power. As power increases, these things respond. Okay, so like I said at first, heart rate is the biggest response, right? So as power goes up, our heart rate increases. Now, you know, before we didn't really know why heart rate increased. Why is my heart rate 150? Well, you know, did you just sprint up a hill? Did you, you know, um, climb a mountain for an hour and a half? Did you have 17 shots of espresso and you're sitting on the start line ready to go? Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't tell us the work. So these are really responses. And then we can think about it from that too. The lactate in our blood increases as power goes up. The volume of oxygen that we take into our body goes up. And the blue line here, the rate of perceived exertion, that increases. Wow, this is harder, this is harder, this is really, really hard, right? Um, those are the things that increase. So when we start to think about that from that perspective, that's what we really wanna do is we wanna know the training dose. And that's what we look for when we, when we think about this is, is that training dose. Mm -hmm. I know from my own experience, like heart rate, as you mentioned, is kind of an imperfect tool because there's so many other factors that go into it. It's correlated and it's helpful for knowing how hard you're going, but there are a lot of other factors. Like if you're sick, your heart rate might be higher than it usually is. If you just did a huge training day or a race, the next day, your heart rate might be impacted by being higher or lower. Usually it's higher. Um, there's a whole bunch of different factors, but like heat that goes into it, heat versus riding in cool temperatures. Um, and then like you mentioned with caffeine, having those espressos like that can all impact your heart rate. So it's not really like a perfect measure of what you're actually outputting, but that, but power is that, that metric. It is. It is. And, and here's a great slide too, is why is that important? Why? I mean, okay, we know what it is. We know, you know, a little bit about the work piece but it is the direct inter determinant of performance velocity or velocity. So it measures the sum of all of the forces resisting you on the bicycle, right? So you're going through space and you've got rolling resistance. You know, what kind of road are you on? You've got rolling resistance in the bearings of your hubs, right? The bottom bracket, uh, the chain drive, how much lube on your chain do you have? Because you can lose 15 watts just in your chain if you don't lube your chain, 
um, gravity, all these things. But the number one thing is your aerodynamic resistance. How aero are you in cutting through that wind? So for example, you know, I can, I can ride my beach cruiser um, at, you know, sitting upright on my beach cruiser and my, my flip flops on in the summer and I can do 300 watts on my beach cruiser because I have a power meter on my beach cruiser. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of course and, you do. Leave it to Hudson to put a power meter on his beach cruiser. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm going 18 miles an hour, right? I'm sitting up, I got big tires. They're not really inflated that well. I got an old rusty chain because of the beach cruiser has got a rusty chain on it, right? So I'm working really hard to just barely go 18 miles an hour um you know at my ftp basically right then you take me and you put me in an arrow position like this where i've got arrow shoe covers on i've got an arrow helmet i'm on a crazy arrow bike with arrow wheels uh, an arrow skin suit all of these arrow accoutrements that you can do and put in there and now i take the same 300 watts and now i'm going 27 28 miles an hour haven't changed the amount of work that I'm doing. I've just merely changed the shape that I am in the bicycle resistance. I've reduced that a tremendous amount. So now I'm flying through the air. Uh, and so that's another, you know, what it's, this is really important. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that's really interesting to me as a triathlete, because we are in an arrow position the whole time that we're riding and it's, it's key and really, really, um, really intriguing to me to see that you could be going two miles an hour faster on the same watts uh, or you could be going uh, on fewer watts the same speed and so therefore not maybe smoking yourself so much so that when you get off the bike you can actually run really well um, yeah. so being able to find those savings is really only possible if you have a power meter exactly exactly you know it takes three watts of of uh, work to move your cable, your brake cable, or your derailleur cable through the air. So it's really important that if you're trying to be as aero as possible, tighten all those cables up, you know, put them so that they're right there in front of the head tube and get them all tied up so that they're really clean. Um, because, you know, add up that times four, there's 12 watts right there. I mean, that could be the difference between, you know, winning and losing in a race easily, triathlon, anything. You know, cycling, race, anything. So talk about how power could be used for like longer endurance races, whether it be just pure cycling or in a triathlon. Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, let's think about it from a couple of different perspectives. Um, there's um, one thing that, uh, that we always think about is pacing, right? So pacing is super important and we think about it, um, pacing. So I've got a great slide here uh, that helps us with, um, pacing guidelines. So we came up with a pacing guideline for triathlons. So pacing is important and nutrition is also really important because, um, you know, when you get rid of everything, you know, Matt, when you take away all the aero stuff, when you take away all of the, the fancy, um, you know, skin suits and things and widgets and stuff, you know, what's the sport really? And, and really this is a sport of pacing. Um, some people like to do it on bicycles. Some people like to do it running. Some people like to do it swimming. Some people like to do it on all three. Um, you know, some people like to pace themselves on the couch drinking beer. So, <laughs> <laughs> but but we we like pacing ourselves and learning pacing. And so pacing using power is really important for a long distance. And then saving energy is also incredibly important. And so that's where um, you know we can we can pace and conserve our energy and make sure we have the right nutrition as we put that in too. So we can talk about nutrition in a little bit. But let me let me show you a little guideline here that I put together. It's in in our book for time trials and triathlons. And if you think about this, um, and I have to step back a little bit for those people who are watching who are um, don't haven't used a power meter yet. But there's a concept called functional threshold power. And that is FTP. And that's basically is hard, the most, the highest average watts that you can maintain for about an hour. Okay. So let's say you go out and you do a time trial for an hour, you average 250 watts. That's what your FTP is. 
And that establishes our baseline from which all of our training zones are built. And then that establishes our pacing as a way to pace our energy outlet. So for example, if you're doing a sprint um, distance triathlon, very short um, bike, you can ride right at your FTP and above that for that distance and still have a good run afterwards. So you're really pushing yourself there. At Olympic distance, you're a little bit below it and right at your FTP the whole time. Now, most people can ride, you know, if they're just cycling, they would ride right at their FTP the whole time because that's about an hour or so. That would be kind of the definition of FTP. When we go to half Ironman, now energy conservation is a real key factor and we will ride between 80 and 85% because you've got a half marathon to do afterwards. So you wanna make sure that you can do the half marathon and actually run it and not walk it. Uh, Ironman, then 68 to 78%. And to kind of give you a, an example here of an Ironman, the difference between the Ironman, it seems like that's a, a fairly narrow window and it is fairly small, but a brand new Ironman, a first timer at the Ironman, um, they may ride at 68 to, to uh, you know 70% of their FTP for the entire Ironman and still have plenty of energy to, to finish the marathon at the end. Um, I've got files from winners of the uh, multiple Ironman uh, pro triathletes uh, from their winning, uh, winning rides and lots of different Ironmans. And they ride at about 78%. So they're still really low underneath their FTP, just kind of in this, this what we call the tempo range of training. Um, but it, it's like, wow, somebody who's a first timer to the elite of the elite winning pro triathletes, triathlons, only 10% difference. So well, you can see that having a power meter and knowing what wattage range you need to be in is really critical for a long distance lifestyle. Yeah, when I first started doing triathlon, especially when I got up to the half Ironman and Ironman distance, when pacing becomes really paramount, being able to finish those races strong really relies on, like you said, sort of two things, the pacing and the nutrition. And the pacing side of things was made so much easier once I had a power meter. I was able, you know, what I had done in the past, my first few Ironmans before I had a power meter, uh, I would I would go out at what I thought was an easy pace by perceived effort, but because you're so fresh and excited in a race scenario like that at the beginning, I always found I just ended up going out too hard. And then once I got a power meter is when it really became apparent to me that I had always been going out too hard because I would do the same thing at the beginning of the bike. I'd go out at that pace that I thought was easy. Then I'd look down at my watts and I'd be like, wow, I'm at 90% of my FTP right now. I shouldn't be doing this. I've got a long day. I had it made in an Ironman. I should be at maximum around, you know, 75-ish percent. So I'm definitely going too hard right now. And so then I would pare it down and then it would feel really, really easy. Like, oh, wow, this is, this is what it's supposed to feel like? I'm like, this is right. too easy. And I almost didn't even trust it. But then by the end of the five hours, give or take, that I was on the bike, then I realized, wow, okay, it's getting pretty tough now to hold even just 75%. So uh, so yeah, I think that was a good move by not going out at, you know, 80 to something percent of my FTP. Um, so that, that was absolutely key. And that, and that's a, that's a, that's a really good point. I mean, that's a very common mistake that most, um, not most, but many triathletes make and many time trialists make, I mean, many new cyclists who've never done a time trial before. I mean, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're warmed up, you know, you're getting ready for that time trial and you've, you've done your, your, uh, your fast pedaling drills and you've had your, maybe not 17 shots of espresso, but maybe four or five shots of espresso. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and, and you get to the start line and you're just like, go, 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 right. And you're, you're, you're the horse in the, in the, uh, at the Kentucky Derby, let me out, right. I want to go. And then you take off and, the, and, and you're riding down the, the, you know, the first five minutes or whatever, and you're, you're, you're riding at 350 watts and your FTP is 300 watts. And it's like, there is no way on your best day in the entire world are you ever going to hold 350 watts for an hour <laughs> if your FTP is 300 watts. Um, so you save yourself from exploding. Right, right. Because that, as you mentioned, the perceived exertion is not in alignment with the actual exertion. 
your perceived exertion is very low because of the excitement, right? The adrenaline, the freshness, you know, all that stuff. The actual exertion is very high. And so, especially in that, you know, a, a, a time trial for cyclists, um, you know, in the first five minutes, even in the first hour or so for a, a Ironman, we need to make sure that this perceived exertion isn't tricking us and we go with the actual exertion. And that's where that power meter doesn't lie. You know, it's like, 200 watts is 200 watts, whether you're going uphill, downhill, in the rain, on the flats, in the time trial bars, it's 200 watts. That's where you need to hold. Mm -hmm. And we've mentioned nutrition on a couple of occasions now, too, as far as um, a way of being able to finish stronger. Pairing that with pasting is, is key, right? If you, can, if you can nail those two things, you're going to end up finishing your races, whether it be triathlons or cycling, or even just training sessions, a lot stronger if you're able to dial those things in. So for those of you who aren't familiar with what UCAN is, uh, what we're best known for is the carbohydrate in our products called super starch. And it's a really complex carbohydrate that provides long lasting energy that's easy on the stomach and one that allows your body to continue to tap into its nearly unlimited fat stores as well. Uh, and I know that's one of the reasons why you've come to come to use you can. Uh, it's unlike typical sugar or maltodextrin based sports nutrition that provide a spike in a crash effect and it can be very harsh on the stomach. So if you've ever bonked, you've ever run out of energy, you had stomach aches, uh, bloating, been forced to use the bathroom when you don't really want to be during races, uh, then you know how important nutrition can be. And Hunter, what, like, what is it about you can that piqued your interest initially and what keeps you coming back? Well, absolutely, Matt. And here, I brought up the slide here. Um, it's one of the reasons why we use power meters too, is because we need to coordinate our energy intake. Uh, and it's so critical because a power meter measures how much work you're doing. Okay, we measure that in watts, but we get that in what's a, a little number called a kilojoule. Now, uh, a kilojoule, if you add about 10% to that kilojoule, that gives you the kilocalories that you burn. So let's say, for example, you do a thousand kilojoules of work, um, and that would be a really hard hour if you burned a thousand kilojoules in an hour. Um, very hard, not a lot of people can do that but you, can, you know, some people can, that would be about 1100 kilocalories that you would do, that you would, you would have used, so to speak. So we can coordinate and break our segments, break our ride into different segments. I need to eat this much by this point, by this point, by this point. So that's what really started bringing me to you can, um, well, a couple of different reasons. Number one, uh, as a former pro athlete, you know, I had been on this, um, I mean, I absolutely was carbohydrate addicted. Uh, and I was on this roller coaster up and down of just, you know, having simple sugars and then bonking, simple sugars and then bonking. And uh, I knew that one, that was bad for me, not good for my body, not good for my health, but two, it just wasn't fun. Um, and so I had been looking for this way of how can I make sure that my blood sugar is more stable and how can I turn my body from being carbohydrate addicted into more fat burning right I want to burn more fat I want to utilize that fat that I have on board and not be reliant on these simple sugars all the time and so that's what really brought me to you can uh, one of my coaches um, Brian Freeze out of Texas um, you know he started telling me he's like man I'm using this you can stuff and I'm doing these three and five hour ultra mountain bike, you know, type races, and I'm drinking two bottles of you can, you know, and I'm having a you can bar and that's it. That's all I need. Like, I don't even need to drink that much or eat that much because I'm staying in the fat burning zone so much longer. I'm using that fat as my energy store as my energy um, supply. And then I'm coming in the you can helps me keep it, keep it going. So I was very skeptical, of course, and uh, he's like, oh, you got to try it, you got to try it, you got to try it. And uh, so um, I started using it and, and all of a sudden I realized like, wow, this is amazing. Like I'm just not eating and drinking as much as I need, you know, I thought I needed to. Um, and my energy levels are great all the time and I'm not bonking anymore. And, and so for me, that was, um, a really, really exciting eye-opening experience 
and then I started to dig into, you know, the, the, the science behind it. Why is this working? What is this doing? Um, I started to realize that, oh, wow, this is, I mean, you know, this is a revolution in sports drinks in the, in the, in the, in the nutri sports nutrition world. Because Matt, you know, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years now and more than that, 35 years in, in this endurance world. And I've seen so many sports drink companies come and go. I mean, it's like the, you know, the flavor of the year, these guys come in, they think they can stick in some flavors and some simple sugars and throw in some salt in there and they got a sports drink and put a bunch of marketing behind it. And it's the same old, same old. Um, but when you can come along, it's like, wow, this is completely different. Nobody else in the world's got this. This is a revolution and it works. So, uh, it's, it's huge and it makes a massive difference in using, you know, this when you're riding and you're training and when you're setting your pacing guidelines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it made a huge difference to me between pacing and, and nutrition. Uh, th those two things were really some of the biggest breakthroughs I had when it came to, uh, longer distance racing. Um, especially when I started using UCAN in 2014. So let's back, bounce back over to power meters. Uh, I want to go into kind of like the, the how in the last, last you know, segment of our, of our interview and our discussion here. So how do you actually use a, a power meter? I know you mentioned um, FTP testing. Yep. So other, yep. other kinds of testing is, you know, what about like the, you know, there's like a power duration curve, the, you know, right. how do you establish the zones and how do you, you know, what do you do to train in those zones? Like all those different little, little things that, that go um, with, with the how. Oh, perfect. No, that's great. So here's, um, here's a few slides on the steps to it. So one of the things that I think is, um, has been really important was uh, a lot of people, again, asked us, how, how do we use this thing? And so breaking it down into a repeatable process was really important. So number one, we've got to test. We've got to understand what your baseline is right now. Where are you? And then we can figure out, well, quantitatively, how much we can move, what can we move, et cetera. That testing allows us to set your training zones. And then it also allows us to diagnose your strengths and limiters. So what are you good at? Maybe you think you're good at, at sprinting because you beat all the local, your local buddies in, in the group ride. But when you actually get with other sprinters, you're like, well, I'm not so great. Um, so that helps us to kind of understand that a little bit. Um, then that teaches us those three pieces then help us to understand your phenotype. Uh, and so again, are you a time trialist? Are you a sprinter? Are you all arounder? Are you what we call a pursuiter? So the, that phenotyping is really important. From there, then we have to build a plan, right? We have to understand, okay, Matt comes to me and says, Hunter, you know, I want to win this event on June the 5th. It's going to be my peak event. So then let's build a plan around peaking you on that day. Because as a coach, that's the holy grail of coaching. Um, you know, anybody, you know, here, give them a training plan and they go off and do it, they're going to get better. But when you come to me, Matt, and say, I want to win this race on June the 5th and I want to have the best ride of my life. And then I peak you for that day. And that's the real why behind a power meter to get that peak on that day. That's the holy grail of coaching. So once we have our plan, we actually have to do workouts, right? You got to do the work. <laughs> power meter doesn't mean that it's all free, right? You're not just going to get faster automatically, right? <laughs> just putting a power meter on your bike doesn't make you faster. <laughs> <laughs> got to do work. Uh, and then we track all that data, right? So now we got all this data we're looking at. We're trying to make sure that we understand how you're adapting and improving. And then of course you're, you're crushing that goal. Um, so this first phase is simultaneous, right? This all happens like it could even happen in the same day, right? You go out and you do your testing and it happens that this goes on, right? Over time. So we look at that over time, like a, a month, two months, a year, two years, et cetera. So let's talk a little bit about testing and what that first step is, because we, I mentioned FTP, what is our FTP? Again, it's the highest power you can maintain. And this is the official definition here in a quasi steady state without fatiguing. So when you go above it, you're going to fatigue a little quicker. When you go below it, you're going to, your FTP, you're, you can maintain power longer. That's ethereal. It's a little nebulous there. Um, so it's basically, you know, how the best average watch you can maintain for an hour. All right. Now, 
we can determine that a lot of different ways. We can look at the ride file. You send me a bunch of data, man. I can probably pick that thing out like that. But, you know, I've looked at thousands and thousands of athletes now. So it's kind of like reading the matrix for me. Um, and uh, power distribution profile, lactate measurements in the lab. We can look at what's called normalized power. We can do more testing. But really, it's this, this one hour is our gold standard. Now, we also have to do the other pieces of the, of the testing, and we call this the power profile testing, um, in order to get your strengths and weaknesses. So I like to split this into two days. Now, if you're an athlete and you're watching this and you, you've been training for a long time, three, five years or more, you can put all these testing things in one, in one day because you're going to recover between them. You know, testing is training training is testing, right? Testing is training, training is testing. You go out and you train, guess what? You're testing yourself. You go out and you do some tests, guess what? You're doing some training. <laughs> so, you know, if you've been doing this for a while, don't worry about it. You can get them all done at one time. If not, the first two or three years that you've been riding and, 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 and exercising an endurance athlete, I'd probably separate them in a couple of days. First, what, what we start out with is uh, warm up. I love a little bit of fast pedaling re, uh, repeats in the beginning because that warms the muscles, that gets the blood moving, gets the heart rate up a little bit, but doesn't create a lot. You don't have to create a lot of force, right? More of that torque, that twisting again. We're not creating a lot of force, so it doesn't take away from your testing. Ride easy. Then you're going to do a one minute all out effort. Now, everybody, I want everybody to do this, whether you're a triathlete, whether you're a cyclist. Uh, whatever, we need to understand this is a measurement of your anaerobic work capacity. So we need to see what your anaerobic ability is. And this is all out. You're out of the saddle, 15 seconds, going as hard as you can. You're back in the saddle, killing it for the next 15 seconds. And then the last 15, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, you're just dying a slow death. I mean, it's painful, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I've done these before. You're absolutely right. Like, the best way to get that result is to just go absolutely all out. And then you just, I think you, you used the phrase dying a thousand deaths. Dying like a thousand just, deaths. <laughs> yeah. It's just the power is falling off, even though you're trying as hard as hard, hard as you possibly can. But it did result in my best one minute power number that I could, uh, I could possibly get. Yeah, there you go. So that's, that's what we're looking for. So then we take a break. Then we do a five minute effort. Now, this is also very hard, but you've got to pace yourself here. This is a measurement of, of your VO2 max. So how many watts can you produce at your VO2 max is essentially what we're looking for. Um, and this is, um, if you start too hard, you're going to blow up and it's going to be a bad test. So you need to start in a little pace where you're being aggressive, but then also make sure that you're pacing yourself so that in the last 30 seconds, you can bring that pace up and produce more watts, 10, 20, 30 more watts in the last 30 seconds. So pacing is really important here. Then I want you to do a couple sprints. So even triathletes, if you've never sprint before, I still want you to do it because we need to understand what your neuromuscular power is. This is your ability to contract and relax your muscle with how fast can you do it and how much force can you do it with. So we do a couple sprints. Um, I like to do a small ring sprint from a really slow speed, four or five miles an hour, jump on that gear, see what kind of numbers you get. And then I like to do a big ring sprint from about 18 miles an hour. Again, jump on that gear, see what you can get. Some people are better at small rings, some people are better at big rings, so I do both. Day two, now we come into day two, we do our same warm up, okay, 20 minutes, fast pedaling drills, easy, and we repeat our five minute effort, okay? Now this is really critical because guess what we're gonna do? Instead of a 60 minute test, we're gonna cheat. We're going to do a 20 minute test. Okay. Now, um, you know, I know Matt, you, you know, like uh, you've done 60 minute tests before. Um, are those things easy for you? Absolutely not. I mean, even 20 minutes is not easy, but 60 minutes is like, I mean, especially on the mental side of things, it's really hard to get everything out of yourself over 60 minutes. A race scenario helps, uh, going up a hill helps, but it's still, it's a very, very taxing effort for sure. It is, it is. And so, and not a lot of people have a place that they can do a 60 minute test on mm -hmm. without stoplights, without, you know, cars, et cetera. Um, and so we cheat a little bit. We can do a 20 minute test. 
And what we'll do is we'll take 95% of that 20 minutes and use that as a point of triangulation where we're getting, we're, we're getting really close to your FTP. But the key thing, and most people forget this, Matt, is that they forget to do the five minute all out effort. And this thing is not a paced five minute like you did the day before. I want you to go hard and your power is gonna come down the entire time of the five minute because I'm blowing out your freshness and your anaerobic work capacity. I wanna get rid of that so it's not a factor. And I want you to be pre-fatigued before you get into that 20 minute, because again, we're cheating a little bit, it's 20 minutes and we're gonna take a little bit off of that, 5% off of that. So we need to kind of fatigue you a little bit so that we get closer to that 60 minute number. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I never really understood the purpose of that five minute test. I knew that it was a blowout. I didn't really know what that meant. Um, but really, I guess what you're trying to do is, um, is fatigue you and sap away some of that neuromuscular system. Yep, exactly. Yep, anaerobic capacity. Get rid of the anaerobic capacity, the neuromuscular power. Let's get rid of that. And then boom, now you're going to be more aerobic and have a much better, um, you know, much, much better approximation of what your FTP would be for 60 minutes. So um, I've got, we gotta, we're gonna wrap up here and make sure we're cognizant of everybody's time. And I, we promised, you know, about a 40, 45 minute uh, discussion here. So um, one last question for you is like, how are power meters available for anybody who's looking, who's maybe really intrigued by this and really wants to go out and get a power meter and start using it. And uh, what's the best way that they can get one? Like what forms are they available in? Uh, you know, what, maybe some brand names that you've, you've used before. Oh, it looks like you've got a slide. Yeah, there you go. Um, so, so the, there are lots of different ways that power is measured. Um, the most popular is in the, in the crank or actually accurately is more the spider. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can do that. Um, and then the, there's a hub based one, the power tap, which um, Cork or SRAM bought. And they're actually, they've stopped making that. So that's a real bummer because that was a great uh, power meter. Um, there's pedal based as well. And then the iBike does what's called the opposing forces method. So let me show you the, the um, I'll skip forward here to the SRM. The SRM was the one that was the very first one basically that came out um, and they are in the spider. So the spider is this piece between the crank arm here and the chain rings, okay? So it's this uh, pentagonal thing right here. This is the one that is the spider. And in this SRM, they have these uh, stanchions here, these little uh, bars here. That's where the strain gauges are glued. And then there's torsion. So imagine if you're standing behind your bicycle and you're looking at the, the, the crank arm and the spider, that spider twists internally when you crank. Okay, so it's twisting, it's got twisting going on. And then that force goes into the chain ring and then that goes into the chain back to the hub. So this is a great place to measure it um, because it's really close to where you are. So, um, but you need to make sure you've got one that's, that works there. There are pedals like the SRM has pedals here that they, they also make. Um, let me show you the power tap pedals as well. They're excellent too. Um, Favero, uh, there's an Italian company that makes pedals as well. Pedals are really nice because, um, and there's a couple other ones. Um, there's the Quark, of course, um, Power to Max. And let me show you this one. Uh, let's see, here's the, uh, the, 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 where is it? Info Crank. This is a great one too. Um, and this is actually in the crank arm as well. And kind of one thing that they're very accurate because they actually are in the crank, um, but they're also left and right. Same thing with pedals and a couple of the other cranks in the and like the Shimano ones too, you're seeing both right leg and left leg. And so it's really nice to see what's happening with the right side and what's happening with the left side because we, we're not asymmetric. I mean, we're not symmetrical. We are asymmetric. We're, one leg is always gonna be stronger than the other. One phase of our pedal stroke is the left leg going down, the right leg opposing, or is the right leg going down, the left leg opposing, which phase is stronger? And can we change that or improve that? So sometimes it's nice to have that left, right power meter. Um, you know, for other people, it might be like, this is too much information. 
<laughs> I like to geek out on all the data. And I think many of the listeners, if they're tuning in for this on power meters, is they, they might be like me and you. So yeah, there you go. Uh, so there's some great options out there. The, and the, the, so let me go back, let me go to the, uh, uh, the, the question that you're really asking <laughs> that everybody's watching, which one's the best one for me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so what's your budget, right? You gotta look at your budget. Uh, and, and power meters used to be thousands and thousands of dollars. They've really come down a lot in price. You can actually get power meters now, as you mentioned in your slides here, uh, some of them are in the hundreds of dollars. So, uh, you know, it makes it pretty affordable, affordable for somebody who, maybe already has a bike that's you know really nice and it's thousands of, or thousands of dollars yeah no i mean if you wanted back in the day when you wanted to buy an srm it was three or four thousand dollars to buy one of those things so i mean it's that's insane mm -hmm. now i mean now you can get one for three or four hundred dollars which is great um mm -hmm. are you dedicated to your wheels now most of us are have special wheels for this and that and this and that so then that kind of throws away the power tap hub piece but again the power tap hub thing isn't really part of the equation now they're not making anymore what pedals do you use if you're a diehard speed play person and you use speed play pedals all your life probably need to stick with speed play and not get the power meter pedals um, now if you're on a look or a shimano platform no problem because you can convert right over there your knees are going to be fine um, do you travel a lot well 2020 i don't travel any <laughs> but I used to travel a lot and um, pedals are great because I can stick pedals and I can stick my cycling shorts, my jersey and my my shoes and my pedal wrench in my suitcase and I can get it at any gym at any hotel and take the pedals off whatever rickety old exercise bike they had, stick those pedals on there and bring my Garmin with me or my Wahoo or whatever it, my head unit is and I would have a power meter and I can do a workout. So that's a factor, right? But the biggest one here is number five, you know, what bike frame do you have? Because a lot of these power meters don't fit your bike frame. And it's really important to make sure you get one that fits your frame. Every bike frame is like, they got all these weird odd duck bike bottom bracket widths and sizes and press fit and not press fit and blah, blah blah and it's like it's a nightmare um so you need to make sure that you've got one that fits your bike and then if you're the person who's like well you know i'm thinking for christmas of buying a new bike or maybe next year i'll get a new bike then be careful too because if you're going to get a new bike that power meter that you bought for your current bike may not be compatible with the new frame so it's kind of important that you're you're careful with that too so Hope, hope that helps people. Yeah, absolutely. I wish I knew all these things when I was shopping for my first power meter. I was just cobbling together information from a whole bunch of different sources. So I didn't have Hunter Allen, the guru, uh, to help me out and make, make that decision. Well, thanks. Thanks. That's great. So we're going to wrap it up here. Um, unless there's any other things that you'd like me to, or that you'd like to touch on that we haven't um, addressed at all before we wrap up. No, I mean, I think this is a great little overview. I think this is really good. I mean, um, I think the one thing that uh, I guess I would like to say is remember that the ultimate purpose is 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 to figure out, um, you know, how to optimize you, right? How to make sure that we're taking the time that you have available because we're all time constrained, right? And I only got eight hours a week to train, right? I want to optimize that time because I have goals. You know, I want to do this event and I need to make sure that I'm fit and I accomplish my goal there. So we're trying to optimize you. And we do that through a couple of different ways. One, planning the big picture. You know, Matt, I want you to win that race on June the 5th. I want you to peak on that day, have the best ride of your life, the best run of your life, the best swim of your life on that day. And then two, we're using our power meter to, um, help us understand and stay in our zones and do specific workouts while we're actually doing work, right? I'm getting the adaptation that I want and need. Um, and then three, we're making changes to that based on the data, right? Come back and you look at the data and you see what it is. Okay, do I need to change? Do I need to go harder? Should I have done 10 intervals or should I have done 14 intervals? Um, do I need to take the rest day? So we're looking at that big picture to understand too, where are you from, 
from a, a cumulative standpoint. So if we think about those things, that's, that's, that's the gist of it. Excellent. Well, first of all, a huge thank you to you for your infinite wisdom and for sharing a lot of what you know. And it, you know, I guess we're really only scratching the surface here, but sharing a lot of, you know, a lot of the basics of what you know on power meters. Uh, if anybody's looking to try UCAN, uh, we have a code uh, felt that you can use at UCAN.co to give it a try. Uh, and also, if you want to reach out to Hunter and Peaks Coaching Group, he has an amazing network of coaches that are all very, very well versed in power meter training and racing. Uh, of course, to be part of Hunter's Hunter's network. And so you can reach out to Hunter uh, at peakscoachinggroup.com. Uh, fantastic network of coaches. And I think you still have some limited spaces available for 2021. We do. We have some slots available. So, so call me up. Glad to help. Great. And uh, a big thank you to, to Felt as well for partnering with us on this event uh, and putting this together and bringing Hunter's expertise and, and wisdom here to share with all of you. So have a great night, everybody. Thank you. See you, thank Matt. You, See you.